Dime a mí. Psalm 103, 17, it says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. A golfer stood over his tee shot for what seemed like an eternity, at least to those he was playing with. He was looking up, he was looking down, he was measuring the distance and figuring out the wind direction, the speed. He was driving his golfing buddies nuts doing all this as you can well imagine finally his exasperated buddies said hey dude what's taking so long hit the blasted ball the guy answered well my wife is up there watching me from the clubhouse i want to make this a perfect shot he said forget it man you'll never hit her from here <laughs> when i was a kid um i my dad and I dabbled a little bit in golf. I, he tells me that I was somewhat decent at it. Actually, he says I was pretty good at it, but I don't think I was. <laughs> okay, well, he never said that. He never said that then. I imagined that he was an encouraging father in that way. But I dabbled a little bit in golf, and you know I had a little bit of ability, but you know, I was too interested in other things to really keep uh, enough playing, to play enough to really uh, excel at it, I guess. But anyway, I remember one time that I was on, and I can't remember if I was with Mark, with my friend Mark, when this happened or what, but I was oh, on, a, yeah. we were on a par three, and I was teeing off, and... I hit the ball. There was a man working out in his yard down at the other, kind of past the par three there on the right-hand side. And I teed off, and the ball went through the air. And I didn't see it hit, but I heard a, like a real hollow knock sound, you know. And, and I thought, well, it, you know, it hit a tree somewhere over there. Went over there, looked, and the guy was handing us the ball. <laughs> and, and it popped him on the head. I guess it bounced off some trees and hit him on the head because he was alive, you know. I heard a story of a young girl who had been learning to golf. After teeing off on one of the holes, her boyfriend, uh, who was intent on getting the ball to the to the to the hole in, in one you know shot, he he swung as hard as he could, but he hit that ball wrong and it, it went off to the right. And he hated to lose his ball, so he was going out to to look for that ball. He was not going to lose it, and her. You know, she was, she was too busy concentrating on her shot, and she didn't realize that he had gone off in front and was standing out there. And she went to take the shot, and she swung, and as soon as she hit the ball, she looked up and saw him standing there and saw her, the ball that she hit going straight towards him, and she panicked. And she, she couldn't remember what to say. And, and so the ball came, you know, just close to him, and he ducked down instinctively. It didn't hit him. But he said, what are you doing? She said, oh, I couldn't remember the number that I'm supposed to yell. She's like, the number you're supposed to yell? What are you talking about? What number are you supposed to yell? She said, four, right? That was the number she was supposed to yell, right? Four? Of course, it's not a number that you yell out. <laughs> Actually, I you know I don't I'm not sure anybody really knows why you yell four. Maybe it's because of a boat. You have the four in the aft, and it's to look ahead. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know why you yell four. But she didn't know. She didn't yell four. Why didn't she yell four? She forgot. She was a new golfer. In the panic of the moment, because she lacked experience, she froze. She just forgot. 
You know, golf balls can travel at around 250 feet per second. So getting hit by a golf ball is pretty dangerous. And this girl endangered her boyfriend because she forgot to yell for. Forgetting can be dangerous. Forget to keep an eye on the oil in your car and you can ruin the engine. Forget to turn off an eye on the stove, you can burn down the house. Forget to change the batteries on your smoke detector, and when you burn down your house, you may go down with it. Forget your wife's birthday, well, you might as well burn the house down and go with it. In chapter 5, Moses reminded Israel of the Ten Commandments. They would soon be entering into the promised land and they needed to be reminded of the law so that they would dwell in the land with blessings. And it's true that God desires His best for us all, but sometimes we choose something, maybe something easier, something that can be found on a lower shelf. It might be easier to reach, but if we would just look to our Heavenly Father, we would find that He will gladly hand down to us from the top shelf. All kids know that the best toys are kept on the top shelves. God desires to hand down to us from the best, but when we are disobedient, there is rebuke that comes our way rather than blessing. And when we try to go it alone, the best we get are you know, dollar store items, whoopee cushions and glow sticks that are already, you know, you open the package and they've already been, they're already lit and they're dying, you know. But on that top roof, that top shelf, you know, that's where the, the full scale model of the, the Millennium Falcon is, you know, the thing that you really, really wanted. The more we are reminded of how we are expected to behave the more we remember how we are expected to behave. The more God can bless us. And then God God can bless us rather than spending all that time disciplining us. God said to Moses in Deuteronomy 5.29, He said, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. It's God's desire that we dwell well and be blessed with Him rather than choose to camp where His judgment will fall. Let's remember that where we choose to set our camp, there our family goes with us. In Genesis, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And guess where his family went? Out from the presence of the Lord. Lot departed Abraham's camp, and he went into Sodom. Guess where his family went? With him into Sodom. The established pattern is that the children go where the parents direct them. And sometimes it may seem as if that is not the case. Yet most of the time, the child eventually goes in the direction that was established by his parents. In our text for this evening, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses issues a caution to Israel that they must raise their children in the ways of the Lord. Good parents desire for their kids to enjoy blessing and privilege, to have good things, to live well, and be a contributing member of society. God is telling us that if we want to have the kind of family that will make us proud, If we want a G-rated family, a God-rated home, then you and I need to remember certain things. And we need to teach our families to remember those things. So that will be the focus of our study this evening. Our goal is to learn to be reminded that where we go, our families go. And if we are forgetful of the Lord, so they will be. In today's teaching, we will answer some questions that will change the course of your family for the better, if you're willing to accept the exhortation of Scripture. Those questions that we will answer are these. What do we need to teach our families to remember? 
Why do we need to teach our families to remember? And how do we put God first? How do we structure our family life so that God comes first among all our other priorities? So let's dig in. Let's get the answers to these questions. Deuteronomy 6, starting with verse 1. It says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Verses 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy 6 are what's known as the Shema. But those are not the entire Shema. The, the entire Shema is generally comprised of three sections of scriptures. You have two from Deuteronomy and one from Numbers. It's the first two parts of the Shema that are written on parchment and placed inside of the mezuzah. Uh, that elongated box or, or tube that's placed on the doorpost. Um, most often you see them at the doorposts of Jewish homes. Now Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 that's the best known part of the Shema. In Hebrew, it is Shema Yitzrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Now, Shema means here. And so these two verses, this section is called the Shema because that's the first word of it. Shema Yitzrael, Hear Israel. Of the 613 commandments found in the law, Jesus chose this. We've talked many times about the Shema in the past, so I, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but of all the commandments Jesus could have chosen when asked what is the greatest commandment, Jesus started off with this one. He went back to this. You know, and according to Jesus, this is not just a good commandment, this is the greatest commandment. And it's the commandment by which obedience to all the other commandments comes. Where there is no love for the Lord, there can be no true obedience to His statutes. So love for the Lord is an important part of any Christian family. And instilling a love for the Lord in our children will reap great rewards in the future. Let's continue reading. Verse 6 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the first question we want to answer this evening is this. What do we need to teach our families to remember? What is that? A Sunday school teacher asked a group of children if any of them could recite the entire 23rd Psalm. One little four-year-old girl raised her hand, and the teacher, being a bit skeptical, thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe she actually can. She said, can, why don't you quote it for us? Tell us what Psalm 23 says. And the little girl smiled, and she said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. We, we live in an R-rated world that wants to take God out of the government, out of the schools, out of the whole public arena. And so it's become increasingly important for our children to hear that they need the Lord as their shepherd. And that can be all they'll ever want. He can be all they'll ever want, all they'll ever need. God told Israel to teach their families that very concept, and we would do well to do the same. He told them to remember that the Lord their God was one God. That's that Hebrew word, echad, means one in agreement. That's the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
There is none else who should receive the glory that he is due. God isn't going to share with any little gods or idols. That God had brought them out of slavery. Without him, they would be enslaved to the world, to sin. And they would be due judgment for their sins. God would give them blessings they didn't deserve. They were moving into the promised land. God was giving them this land, but there in that land were wells that they hadn't dug. There were houses that they hadn't built. There were fields that they hadn't planted. And God was giving them all these things. They didn't deserve it. They were to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. Nothing and no one should occupy the throne of our hearts but God. They were to obey all His commandments, decrees, all His laws. God gave them the sacrificial system to temporarily atone for their inability to keep His commandments perfectly. And above all else, they were, never, they were to never take God lightly. God was a merciful God. He loved them very much. But they were always to remember that their God was not a safe God. They didn't want to mess with Him. In other words, God was telling them to put Him first in every area of their lives. God was to be first in their public lives. God was to be first in their private lives. In their schools. In their homes. Where they worked. Wherever they were, God was to be first. He was to be first in their past. He was to be first in their present. And He was to be first in their future. Moses told them that this commitment to God would give their families advantages, blessings, and privileges that no other nation experienced. And that promise is true for us as well. But by contrast, if we don't make this our priority, it's possible to set our families up for failure. There are several, there are several memes, I guess you'd call them, often repeated from uh, time to time, from Christian to Christian. One which is that children from Christian families often quit going to school in early adulthood. Or going to church, I'm sorry, <laughs> in early adulthood. What often escapes mention is that it's the family rather than the church that plays the greatest role in a child's continuing in the faith. Now with that in mind, here's the top 10 ways to turn off your kids to church. I'm grateful that, that we don't experience this kind of thinking here in our congregation. But it's always wise to examine ourselves to make sure that these are not true of us. So the top 10 ways to turn off your kids to church. Number 10 is schedule personal or family events to conflict with church services and activities. Number nine, don't get too close to anyone in church. Refrain from developing relationships with Christians, lest your children learn the joy and benefits of fellowship with other believers. Look often at your watch during worship and complain bitterly. Look annoyed or freak out when church lasts longer than you think it should. Number seven, tithe and financially support your church and its mission, missions that it supports with the same enthusiasm you pay taxes. Number six, do the best you can to make sure the kids arrive on time to soccer lessons and school events, but don't worry if they miss or are late to church. Number five, bring your family to church only when a, you have nothing better to do, or B, you have a personal need, or C, you feel really guilty. Number four, don't volunteer for anything or make any kind of long-term commitment at church. Remember, you've got to keep your options open to do things that are more important. Number three, 
change churches, change churches every few years. Jump around from church to church. Number two, remind your kids how imperfect your church leaders are and regularly point out their mistakes. And number one, whatever you do, don't let church influence the way you live your life. The Israelites were to go to extreme measures to instill in their family a commitment to the Lord, a commitment to those things that please God. So much so that they were to talk of them in the house. They were to talk of them while walking. Talk of them while laying down to sleep and when waking up. God's word was to be before them everywhere. Verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God, is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. So God was giving Israel not only the land, but also all those things that were already in the land. Homes they didn't build, wells they didn't dig, crops they didn't plant. Whole cities were given to them by God. God would be their help and their strength. But they would have to choose to refrain from those things that were pagan and improper for the people of God. The people who were in the land... They had many things which God would give Israel for their use. But they were to shun anything that was contrary to the Lord. Now the second question that we seek to answer this evening is this. Why do we need to teach our families to remember? There was a young Jewish boy that grew up in Germany many years ago. This boy had a profound admiration for his father. His father saw to it that the life of the family revolved around the religious practices of their faith. Their father led them to the synagogue faithfully. In his teen years, however, this boy's family was forced to move to another town in Germany. And this town had no synagogue, only a Lutheran church. Now, the life of the community in that town revolved around the Lutheran church. All the best people belonged to it. Suddenly, the father announced to the family that they were going to abandon their Jewish traditions and join the Lutheran church. When the family, who was obviously stunned by this, asked why, their father explained that it would be good for his business. The youngster was bewildered. He was confused. His deep disappointment soon gave way to anger and a kind of intense bitterness that plagued him throughout his life. Later, he left Germany and went to England to study. While he was there, he began to write a book. In that book, he introduced a whole new worldview and he conceived a movement that was designed to change the world. He described religion as the opiate for the masses. He committed the people who followed him to live their lives without God. Now, who was this Jewish boy's name? What was his name? Karl Marx, the founder of the communist movement. The history of the 20th century was significantly perverted by Marx's teachings, and it can be traced back to his father who sold out his faith. Now when we hand our faith over to the highest bidder, we set our families up for discouragement. We set our families up for failure. But God promises that if we put Him first in our family, He will give us certain blessings. Now, that doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen to us. Jesus Himself said that in this world, we'll have trouble. We will face sickness. We will face loss, hardship, and death because we live in a fallen world. But God promised Israel that when bad things happen, 
He will be there to give them strength. God is consistent. And while we don't want to usurp the promises that God made to Israel and place them on ourselves, we can learn from God's promises to Israel about what we can expect when God is honored in our own lives. And what these promises in Deuteronomy 6 mean for us is that when bad things happen to us, God promises He will be right there giving us the strength to face whatever this world throws at us. And if we strive to put God first in our family life, then God promises blessings such as it will go well with us. We will prosper. We will eat and be satisfied. We will receive righteousness. God will deal with our enemies. Verse 16 continues. It says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massah. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. When your son asks you in times to come, saying, What is the meaning of these testimonies, these statutes, and these judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before your eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Well, while Israel was to live according to the statutes of the Lord, The other nations that were around them would not. This means that their children would notice a difference in the way that they lived and the way that the other nations lived. I think most parents have probably had that experience where their children want to do something that the other kids are doing because it looks like great fun, but the parents have a conviction that their children shouldn't do those things. And sometimes it's a conviction that they personally have, and other times it's a conviction because those things are flagrantly pagan. Now, in those days and for Israel, it would have been things like the Sabbath, dietary restrictions, jubilees and such, that would have stood out, as well as pagan ceremonies or certain ways of dress and other things that they didn't participate in that would have stood out in the minds of the kids. So Israelite kids, they may have thought, wow, that looks like great fun that all these others are having. Why do my parents have to be so strict? Things have changed a lot from now, from then to now. But in regards to obedience to God, things haven't changed. We still must guard against wrong influences while not sheltering our kids in such a way that they are unaware of what is sinful. You know, in order to eat, young animals who who live by the sea need to learn how to fish. Seals, sea lions, uh, polar bears, you know, dive into water and and come up with a fish. Then they release it in front of their their hungry youngsters, I guess you'd call them, hungry, hungry pups, whatever. They release the fish in front of them, and this encourages them to grab the fish before it can escape. And it doesn't take very long for the children to figure out and become actually quite good at fishing. But survival also includes avoiding dangers. A mother deer teaches her fawn to fear man by herself demonstrating a fear at the sight or the scent of of people. And when a wolf comes near a trap with her cubs for the first time, she shows great fear and her young ones see her reaction and they're helped by that way to learn that traps are to be avoided. And during experiments, it's been observed that giant rats born in captivity, 
they didn't react when they were placed in a, in a cage with a large python. They actually went right up to the python and would sniff the python's head. Obviously, they didn't live long. Now, many young Christians quickly stumble when they leave home for college or to pursue a career because they you know, haven't been taught how to recognize danger. The law served to not only make people aware of sin, but to teach people to avoid sinning because there were penalties. But God did not give Israel the law without giving them understanding of the benefits of keeping His commandments. And we mentioned that list earlier of the blessings that God promised for keeping Him first. Those are all things that are found within this chapter. It will go well with us. was from verse 18. We will prosper from verse 24. We will eat and be satisfied. Verse 11. We will receive righteousness. We saw that in verse 25. And God will deal with our enemies in verse 19. And God didn't just say, do this or else. He explained what happens when you do keep Him first. And what happens when you fail to. It's good that we advise our children of the good things, but they also must be aware of the dangerous things. For the Christian family, that means putting God first, doing those things that please Him and making sure their children understand what to avoid. Our children should be taught not just the blessing of obedience, but the hardship of disobedience. In this way, they are able to press into the Lord and taste and see that He is good. Our next question is this. How do we put God first? How do we put God first? How do we structure our family life so that God comes first among all our priorities? Well, Deuteronomy tells us, do your faith all the time. We read earlier, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, don't make your faith a once a week thing. Your kids need to see how much you love God every day. And church is an important part of that. Your pastor, the youth leaders, Deacons, Sunday school teachers, they're all here to help and encourage you and, and reinforce your interactions with your, your children in your home. But we can't do your faith for you. We are able to pour into you, we're able to pour into your children, and that amounts for at most eight hours of time a week. That leaves 162 hours, and it's the parents who have the lion's share of that time with their kids. Deuteronomy 6 is telling us that we can't expect our families to catch our faith by osmosis. We can't expect them to just stand around us and absorb our belief because we think good, godly thoughts. Notice the way we're told to share our faith with our families. Emphasize your faith to your children. The Bible says, teach them diligently. Talk about your faith everywhere. That means at home, on the road, when you go to bed, when you get up. Tie it to your hands. What is most often in your hands? Is it the Bible, a remote control, or, a, or phone? Bind it on your forehead. What occupies the majority of your thoughts will have a lot to do with what you put before your eyes. Write it on your door frame. Don't leave your faith at home. And don't leave it at church. Consistently be consistent. Emphasize, talk, tie, bind, write. Those are all action words. God is not asking for a mumbled, quiet devotion. He wants a shouting kind of devotion. And this shouting devotion has got to be your true faith. It shouldn't be put on. It shouldn't be something that you just wear on your sleeve. 
Because if your faith is not real, then your children will know it. And they'll have a word to describe who you are. That word is hypocrite. You don't want that to happen. That will defeat the entire purpose. So how do I actively make my faith real for my whole family? Now, be faithful in doing the basics. Going to church regularly. Reading your Bible. Praying. Tithing. Devotion time. The Bible makes the proclamation of faith a very personal thing to be done by every Christian. Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers saying, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. A very real part of your own proclamation of faith is doing the very basic things that all believers should do. They are very basic, but they are also very visible. If you're not tithing, your family knows. Your unbelieving spouse knows. If you do not have a commitment to church, your family knows. The conclusion they will come to is that Christianity is a matter of convenience rather than a matter of faith and sacrifice. There was a young boy that went on an errand for his mother and as any young boy wants to do, he wanted to please his mother. He wanted to make her happy. and He run on an errand to go down the street to a little grocery store and buy a dozen eggs. Walking out of that store, he tripped and he dropped the sack and all those eggs broke. The sidewalk was an absolute mess. The boy, he was trying hard not to cry. And a few people gathered to see if he was okay and to tell him how sorry they were. In the, the midst of all the words of pity that people were speaking, one man handed the boy a quarter. Then he turned to the group and he said, I care 25 cents worth. How much do the rest of you care? James 2.16 points out that words don't mean much if we have the ability to do more. We all have the ability to do the basics. Even the tithe, even when it doesn't seem like we have that ability, we do. It just often means a minimum of of self-denial. Doing the basics is critical to impressing your children with how much God means to you. But as significant as that can be, it's even more important to make sure we share our faith with our kids deliberately and intentionally. Deuteronomy 6-7 says we need to emphasize our faith to our children. The Hebrew word there for teach is shanan, which means to repent. I'm sorry, to repeat, not to repent. It means to repeat. Any parent understands the amount of repetition that is required for a child to hear what you're actually saying. Don't play in the toilet. Don't play in the toilet. Don't play in the toilet. If we don't impress what is right upon our children now, then we will be trying to pull our kids out of the toilet bowls of the world when they are old enough to be out from under our wings. Making your faith real to kids can be as simple as telling your kids how much God has blessed you because of them. In doing this, you're telling your children that you love them. You're telling... You're telling them how grateful to God you are for them, that that God has blessed you with them. Creating a special time just for you and your kids, maybe taking them out for a meal, breakfast, or something like that, or taking a walk with them. If your life is just super busy, then have a time with them before they go to bed. Maybe reading the Bible with them before they go to sleep. Be very intentional about recognizing and using teachable moments. These moments might be hard to recognize at first, but the more you do, the easier it becomes. Many people create habits in their lives to achieve a goal. Some people make a habit of 
counting calories or, or doing exercises. Some people make a habit of reading or listening to a certain number of books every month. If we can make those kinds of commitments, then certainly we can commit to making teachable moments a habit. Most importantly, the one thing you really must share is your God stories with your children. Those are the stories that tell how God has worked in your own life. Moses told Israel that when their children ask, tell them of how God brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So God is saying, tell your kids what I've done for you in the past. Tell your children your God stories. The goal of our study tonight was to learn or be reminded that where we go, our families go. And if we are forgetful of the Lord, so will they be forgetful of the Lord. I think the Lord has, through His Word tonight, reminded us and even taught us how to shore up our families. Not by being reminded of these things, nor of knowing these things, but by doing these things. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this evening. We thank You for Your blessings in our lives. Lord, all of us here have a God story probably many. Lord, while not all of us here tonight have children, we have families. We have spouses. We have brothers, sisters. And we have the congregation here and the children that are here who each look up to each of us. Lord, help us to be very intentional in demonstrating that you come first. That you are the top priority in our lives. Lord, help us to lead our families. To teach our kids. Oh, yeah. And Lord, keep us ever reminded that we are stewards of a very special blessing that you've placed in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the families here. We thank you for all your blessing, all your provision. Like Israel, we are undeserving. Yet you lay blessing and provision upon us. The greatest provision, Lord, being Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. Lord, we place ourselves before you this evening. We ask that you give us opportunities in the coming rest of this week to proclaim wherever we go the Lord God Almighty. Proclaim your grace, your love, and your mercy. Lord, we love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, as Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah, and everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. 
The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus.